Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Hebrews uh, is a sermon that you can find towards the end of the New Testament. I know it sounds like an Old Testament book, but it's a, it's a New Testament book. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that none of you have an evil, unfaithful heart that abandons the living God. Instead, encourage each other every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you become insensitive to God because of sin's deception. We are partners with Christ, but only if we hold on to the confidence we had in the beginning until the end. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and make an assumption that just about every family represented here today has some special family recipe. Something that someone in your family tree, maybe even you, are known for. Whether or not you developed it or stole it from a package and called it yours, there is a famous family recipe. I know there are some in the room, so I want to hear some of them, because I want to know where I'm going to go for dinner in the coming months. I'm going to invite myself over. Yeah. So what? Rocco bars. Okay, can't wait to find out what that is. That sounds awesome. Any Brownies? Blonde brownies, okay. A lot of bacon, yes. What? All right. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Yes, Nan. Cheesecake. All right, yeah. Krista. German chocolate cake. That's right, Amy. Chicken wing dip. Okay, all right. See you Saturday. Yeah, Luke. What? Say it again. Waffles. All right, awesome. And, and how many of you have recipes that have been passed down a couple generations? Right, yeah, even if you don't want to name them. And you know where they came from, you know who they came from. I have shared with you before that we have a semi-famous recipe in our family, but it was like the go-to on the quick nights where like school to turn around to, to church or, or to Little League. It's called cheesy chicken casserole. And this is not going to grace the pages of Bon Appetit magazine. It won't even make the website of Bon Appetit. And that's because it's just two packs of Knorr uh, broccoli che- cheddar rice sides, two cans of chicken, a couple slices of yellow American cheese and some French fried onions. That's all it is at its base. But my mom likes to, as they say in food television, she likes to elevate it. She has a whole, she has a whole palette of sauces and spices that she would use to doctor it up. And uh, thankfully, the copy of the recipe that I have has her palette listed, but there's one, one problem with that. What do you think is missing? The measurements, exactly, right. That's why you called, she called it doctoring it up. I'm just going to doctor it up. And so sometimes it would be more spicy. Sometimes it would be more tangy. Sometimes it would be more savory. Aren't the best family recipes that way? Like, you know what's in it, or you think you know what's in it, but it's not, you can't capture it on a piece of paper. There's something better. To, that's what makes it special. That's part of what makes you want to hand it down. And, and I heard a lot of baking today, and I know baking is, is very, you, you kind of have to be scientific about it, but a lot of cooking is more art than science. Uh, and you can certainly make your own version. Like for me, I, I, I don't particularly like quite the tangy stuff, so I drop the, uh, let's see if I can get this right, Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire, however you say it, um, God rest the queen, uh, whatever the, that, that sauce is, um, and then mustard powder. My, my mom used to like some of the tangy stuff. I lean more savory, so I, I pump up the garlic and onion powder. I try to throw in thyme, different herbs like that. But if I wanted to make it just like my mom did, or if you want to make your recipe just like grandma did or just like great grandpa did, you almost have to have learned from them or learned from someone that learned from them, right? So that you can see the unmeasurable, right? Because how much is a dash and how much is a pinch? That usually depends on where you're from, right? A dash or a pinch may be different. It also may depend on the size of grandma's hands, you know what I'm saying? And There may also be that extra trick or that one or two ingredients that they've started adding along the way that never quite made it onto the paper recipe. Um, I have my own recipe that I'm trying to make famous. It's called Pastor Dan's Holy Fire Salsa. Um, I make my own salsa, uh, and one of my former churches did a church cookbook uh, as a fundraiser, and the recipe is in there, but that is not how I make it. That was like what I could write down while I was making it. I had to just kind of figure it out, and it's changed since then. And I'm not there anymore, and the demand was not great enough to issue an updated and revised version of the church uh, cookbook. There won't be a volume two. Um, so they, they are stuck with an outdated recipe. But I hope one day uh, to be able to teach my daughter Auden how to make Pastor Dan's holy fire salsa. But what if Auden doesn't like salsa? 
I mean, I will have failed as a parent. That's just like <laughs> straight up number one. But what if she doesn't like it? Or what if she assumes, Dad, salsa is so good, but, you know, he'll be around to make it for me. I don't need to learn how to make it. If I ever want it, I'll just call up and ask, and I'll, and I'll get some. Or what if she decides, Dad, salsa is great, but it's too much work, and I'll just get the jarred stuff. Again, I will have failed as a parent, but sometimes that happens. And you know what will happen if that happens? Then Pastor Dan's holy fire salsa will die out from the face of the earth. The actual one will. You know, the, there might be some kid on whatever the TikTok is 100 years from now saying, I found this old church cookbook in a vintage store, and I'm going to try to make this. You never know. But these things, they can die out. Like some of you might not have a famous family recipe, and that may be because there was one, but it was... It died out a couple generations ago. Australian pastor Mark Sayers says that he feels a great deal of grief, but also responsibility for the fact that his famous family recipe is going to die out with him. And it is his great-grandmother's famous Christmas pudding. And he's in Australia. It's part of the British Commonwealth, so they have some weird British traditions. But he says, you know, the, the problem is it's like a three-day process and it has recipes that I don't even, or like ingredients that I don't even know where to find them anymore. And so this recipe is unfortunately just going to die out with me. And that may be sad with a family recipe. We can mourn that. We are in the shame that no one remembers how to make grandma's old whatever it is. But the truth is this kind of thing can actually happen in other far more important contexts as well. Specifically with institutions. Um, that pastor, Pastor Mark, defines institutions in this way. An institution is a repeated pattern of behavior that humans do in social form towards future flourishing. So an institution is a pattern of behavior that, that humans do in social form. So not just individually, but communally. And the goal is to create current and future flourishing. And with a, with a definition that broad, that's how we can talk about institutions like family and marriage. Like, how do we do family? What does marriage look like? It can cover organizations and companies. It can cover churches, from local churches all the way up to denominations. It can cover forms of government, universities, even entire nations. And institutions aren't the organization themselves. It's not the rules. It's not the guidelines. It's not the employee handbook. That's part of it. But remember, it's a pattern of behavior. And all institutions have unspoken rules. We call them norms. Patterns of behavior that we all participate in, even if they aren't codified, even if they aren't written down, even if you're not going to go to jail for breaking them. We have a set of things that we all sort of agree to and practice. And these norms build up because over time, we practice something, we see the value in it, and so we pass it on because we believe if the next generation does it this way, they too will find uh, flourishing. So to sort of bring it back to the recipe illustration, that's why you would want to go and learn from the person who created the recipe. Because you can't capture everything on the page, right? What we do is important, but how we do it and why we do it is just as important, if not more important. And so Pastor Sayers argues that all institutions and organizations that last longer than a generation do so because they have some form of special sauce so to speak. The reason an institution, the reason a church, the reason an organization, the reason a group of people pass on what they're doing is because they've created some sort of special sauce that was of value, something that made an impact, something that caught on, something that seemed worth passing down. But over time, things can change and institutions and organizations can begin to plateau and stagnate and eventually decline. And for the most part, this kind of thing happens in a repeatable pattern or a measurable, discernible pattern. And I'm going to have Sam put up a picture for just a few moments and then we'll pull it down. We'll post it in our Facebook group this week so you can see it if you want. This is sort of the, how organizations stagnate and die. You've got the first generation and they build it and they have an ethic of sacrifice. They put something together that is of value and they give their life or they give their time or they give their resources to build it up. Then you've got your second generation, and they maintain it. And they have an ethic of service. It matters that we continue what the first generation built. Then the third generation begins to assume it. And they have an approach of entitlement. The fourth generation neglects it. And that's when corruption starts to seep in. And then the fifth generation, unfortunately, has to bury it. And they oftentimes experience grief. 
So you've got building it, maintaining it, assuming it, neglecting it, and burying it. Sam, you can take it down, but we'll walk through it a little bit more. So that first generation, they discover the special sauce. They build an institution. They build an organization. They build a nation. They build a company. They build a church. They build a denomination. And it might be intentional, or it might be accidental. It may also occur over time. When we talk about generations, we don't literally mean generations. It may literally be generations, but it doesn't mean father, son, grandson, great-granddaughter, something like that. It's just how we approach these institutions, different eras within institutions. And this first generation, it's often times characterized by sacrifice. How many people know that to start anything new requires sacrifice, right? To start something new, to get it off the ground, to get it going requires sacrifice. And that leads to flourishing, and so we seek to pass it down. There's an interest in that first generation to pass on what they build. And generally speaking, the second generation or the second era within an institution maintains it. They see the importance of it. They see the value of it. They see the flourishing that occurred because of what the first generation discovered. And so they want to continue it, oftentimes out of an ethic of service, right? How many of you have ever seen one of those food documentaries and they're talking to like the, the third generation of some like cookie company? It's like, I want to make it just like granddad did because I want to preserve what granddad did. I want to protect what granddad did. We seek to pass it on. But then eventually we end up in the third generation or the third era within an institution or an organization. And this group begins to assume the secret sauce. They begin to assume the strength and the perseverance within an organization. If it's lasted this long, then it must be strong. If it's lasted this long, then it must be to a degree self-perpetuating. If it's lasted this long, then of course it's going to keep existing. If we've made it this far, it's going to keep going. We assume the presence of the secret sauce, like there's some vault somewhere. We've got enough secret sauce. I don't really have to learn it. I've just got to keep that vault safe. And it's characterized by entitlement. Just like he defined institutions, he defines entitlement as actually the opposite of an institution. So if an institution is a group of people practicing a set of behaviors in order to receive flourishing, entitlement is wanting the flourishing without doing the work, wanting the benefit without learning the recipe and putting in the work to prepare it. And then you get to the fourth generation, and they begin to neglect it. The generation before them didn't learn how to make it. They didn't really protect it. They just kind of used it. It starts to run out, and the fourth generation says, you know, maybe that special sauce isn't so special. Or maybe that special sauce isn't so necessary anymore. It was important at one time, but we don't need it anymore. Maybe the institution or the organization itself isn't necessary, and I can get this flourishing somewhere else. I can get this flourishing on my own terms, in my own way. We begin to to think about ourselves rather than the organization. That's where we get into words like corruption. And I mean, there's literal corruption, as in, I'm going to try to get as much as I can for myself, no matter what it does to the rest of the organization or the world. But then there's also just corruption of the original secret sauce, right? Like New Coke. Whose idea was that? Let's just change it up. We need to change it up. The original recipe isn't good, right? We no longer practice the norms. We throw them out. We no longer live the values. We might not even know the values. We might not even know the original intention. In nonprofits and in churches, we might call this mission drift, right? At one time, we were really focused on accomplishing something, but now we're trying to accomplish too many things, or we were trying to accomplish something, but now our gaze has kind of shifted. And then, unfortunately, you get to the fifth generation And they experienced institutional or organizational collapse, and they have to bury that organization or that institution. And grief arises when, in the absence, they actually realize what has been missing and why that was the key to flourishing. Now, as we walk through this, how many of you had something come to mind? You you know, the funny thing is, after the first service, like five different people came up to me, I know what you were talking about. They all five were different. (laughs) You were talking about this. You were talking about that. Because, I mean, this isn't a hard and fast for every institution or organization, but it is generally, this is generally what happens. And so if you think I'm talking about the church or the denomination, sure, but also no. If you think I'm talking about the country, sure, but also no. If you think I'm talking about the education system, sure, but also no. If you think I'm talking about your family, maybe, but probably not. But it applies. We can all relate to these kinds of things because it happens. 
This process takes place in virtually all organizations, institutions, and companies, from businesses to churches to nations. And I just don't, I don't even want to go anywhere near anything controversial, so let's talk about sports franchises. Let, let's, let's use this as an example, okay? How many of you have strong feelings about a team like the Yankees or the Patriots or the Alabama Crimson Tide? Right? There are these sports franchises that have achieved great success at one time. And so the first generation spends the work and the effort to figure out the system. Figure out the system. That is like, that's, that's Nick Saban 101. Work the plan. Work the system. Follow the plan. They create the plan. The plan works. They get good. That's the first generation. They flourish because of the plan. Then the second generation of players, the second generation of coaches come in. They see the value of that system. They see the value of that plan. They see the value of the work in it. They see what that work achieved, and they want to achieve the same thing. So they say, we're going to do what those original players did. We're going to put in that work. But then you get to the third generation of players or coaches or even fans who assume that the name on the front of your jersey or the logo on the side of your helmet is all it takes to win. You know, how many fan bases think, because we are this team, we're going to win? When we step on the field in this jersey, we're going to be favored every game. We're going to dominate every game. And these players, these coaches, even these fans, they stop putting in the work because they just assume that they are going to flourish because of the name on the front of their jersey. And then you get to that fourth generation, the one that neglects it. They're not playing for the name on the front of the jersey. Which name are they playing for? the name on the back of the jersey. Now, they still want the name on the front of the jersey because that's what gets them on TV. That's what gets them on draft lists. That's what get them talk about on social media, right? They get the exposure, but they're no longer playing for the team. They're playing for themselves. That's corruption of the system. They want to work the system for their own benefit, not the benefit of the team. And then the fifth generation is when the locker room turns toxic and the whole culture implodes. Now... Let's not take it into controversy, but let's make it personal. Is there a group or an institution, from your marriage all the way up to humanity as a whole, is there a group or an institution that you can recognize this pattern happening in? Maybe your work or your school. And of course, you know, just the, the way that, that things ha happen, as I was writing and preparing this message this week, this was the week that the, the Pew Research Center decided to do their annual The Churches in Trouble survey. <laughs> like every year around this time, they like to put out an article that, that tells me I'm fighting a losing battle. And this year, they were even like, we, ex we, we, um, we plotted out four different scenarios for the future of Christianity in America, and all four of them go down. Some slower than others and some faster than others. And I could sit here and think and, and brainstorm and even complain about uh, cultural forces and politics in the church. And, and I can certainly and need to be aware of spiritual forces. There are absolutely 100% spiritual forces that are seeking to fight the church. But I also need to be honest with myself, don't I? And think about myself and the organizations and institutions that I am a part of and, and have been called to uphold and ask, where is the American church? Let's even just broaden it out to the American church. Where is the American church on this spectrum? And I think if we're being halfway in between honest and generous, I think the American church is in the third generation, the generation that's assuming the presence of the institution and the value of the institution. We just assume that the church will always be there. There will always be a church somewhere. Some local congregations will come and go, but the church will always be there. And that there's generally goodwill for the church. That the church is generally well received and that pastors are generally trustworthy. And that, yeah, we have issues and we have things that we need to work out, but they're internal and no one out there cares about them and we'll get through it and we'll figure it out and we'll just move on. The problem, of course, is that where does the third generation lead to? The fourth generation. The fourth generation is the generation that neglects the institution. And it may not be our literal children, but every time we get more survey data, it might actually be our literal children and grandchildren who begin to neglect and move away from the church. 
we begin to seek the benefits of the church in other places. We begin to think that maybe, maybe the special sauce isn't that special. Maybe the church isn't that important. You know, I can listen to Z88.3. I can have worship time in my car. I can listen to a sermon podcast, even this one. You might literally be listening to this in your car right now and be thinking, I'm, I'm getting my teaching for the week. This is awesome. And that's great. I listen to sermon podcasts as well. And then we find our community other, other places. And I, I don't miss the irony that I'm literally in person speaking to a group of people who have chosen to gather, but some of us find our identity and belonging in other places in other organizations. And so we, you see how we can take the benefits, the special sauce of the church, and begin to farm them out? Or we begin to want to make a difference in our community and serve our community, but we do it through other organizations? We start to do it um, through, through politics or nonprofits or volunteer organizations rather than encouraging our church to get involved in the kinds of things that we need to be involved in. And we begin to cobble together the ingredients of the special sauce but rather than working on making sure we're, we're doing them here in the church, we begin to build them from other places. And I own, as a representative, not necessarily literally of Lakeside, but as a representative of the, the small C church, the big C church, the big UMC church, that sometimes we feel called to find those things other places or we look for them other places because our local church may not be actually offering us the opportunity to do those things. And that's on me and on us. But when we begin to turn to these other places, what does that tell us about, what do, we, what do we hope and think and want the church to be? It's the bride of Christ, right? The hands and feet of Christ in the world. It's the community that God intends to use to steward and bless the world. But there's good news. Amen? There's always good news, right? The good news is that the movement across the spectrum, though it is natural and will continue to happen if nothing changes, it is not inevitable because it is not irreversible. If we are, and, and I'll tell you, I think Lakeside is actually in generation two. I don't think Lakeside is in generation three. I don't think that you and we as a community are making a whole bunch of assumptions. I think we are carrying on the work that our founding pastor and that Pastor Cameron put in place. We are a church that's growing. We're going to have two more people join the church today. We are growing. We are, we are making an impact. So I just want to encourage you. This got, this got really serious, and you guys look really sad, and I hope there's cookies left over after worship because you're going to need a little bit of a I think we as Lakeside are in generation two, right? I think we are maintaining. I think we have an ethic of service here at this church. But here's, here's, here's the good news. Generation two doesn't have to lead to generation three, and generation three doesn't have to lead to generation four, and generation two doesn't have to stay in generation two, and generation three doesn't have to stay in generation three. Where do we go? Where can we go? Where should we go? Back to the beginning, right? Back to the beginning. And when we talk about this in a church context, we use words like renewal and revival. And here's the other cool thing. We are literally in this room with this uh, icon on the wall because of renewal and revival. The entire Methodist movement is a renewal and revival moment, or at least that's how it was born. Did you know that the Methodist movement began when a college student went to his older brother, who was an Anglican priest, and said, the church has forgotten the ingredients of the special sauce? That's not literally what he said, although that would have been funny. But Charles Wesley went to his brother John and said, how come when I read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is present and active, and I sit in church, and it's nothing like that? That's how we got started. That is why we are here today. We are people of renewal. We are people of revival. And it took time, and it took trial and error, and it even took some straight-up failure. If you go to Savannah, Georgia today, you will find an 8- or 10-foot statue of John Wesley. John Wesley deserves statues, maybe. He does not deserve a statue in Savannah. It was the site of one of his worst ministry failures, but they put it up because of what he did later in life, not what he did in Savannah. But eventually, through the work of the Holy Spirit and their attentiveness to the leading of the Spirit, renewal was sparked. And it's not just something that we say like in our circles, like, hey, we're revival. Like, the Methodist renewal, the Methodist revival is called one of the great reawakenings in the history of the church. This is studied and agreed upon all across the theological spectrum. 
Our, our friends and, 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 and fellow believers in other denominations study the Methodist revival. This isn't an act of opinion. This is what happened. So that's the good news. So here's the challenge. Pull your, pull your toes back. Change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. If we are in generation two, or we are in generation three, and nothing changes... We, whether that's we Lakeside, we the UMC, we the Big C Church, we the human race, if we do nothing, we will advance down that path. Generation two will lead to generation three. Generation three will lead to generation four. Now, this may not happen in your lifetime, but it, it will happen. But there's another choice for change, isn't there? It's renewal, it's revival, it's rediscovering the special sauce. It's rededicating ourselves to the values of the founding generation. And in the rest of the series, we're going to walk through what Pastor Mark Sayers has identified as three ingredients in the special sauce of the church and the Christian faith. And what I found captivating by his approach, and I hope you'll find it interesting too, is he isn't actually calling us to recapture any specific practice of the church, but rather the posture of the church. Not the practices of faith necessarily, but the postures of faith. Because let me tell you, I have sat in hundreds of discussions about the fate of the church and how we're going to turn it around and what's working and what's not working. And you know what it generally boils down to? Programs and strategies, right? What marketing slogan can, can we throw on a postcard to get people to show up? What program can we offer that will get people who have no interest coming in our door suddenly wanting to come in our door? What, can we, what, what piece of technology can we buy and put on? What will make Pastor Dan look the, the best? What sound, how can we improve our sound quality? How can we make us sound like one of those big fancy churches? But that's not where revival and renewal begins, is it? You know this. You know this inside. You know this in your bones. Renewal doesn't begin with a new camera. Revival doesn't begin with just another Bible study. And oftentimes, the literal practices that sparked revival in one time, in one place, in one context, won't do it again in a different context. So let's use Methodism as an example. Part of what sparked the Methodist revival was John Wesley preaching in the field. Sometimes it was literal fields, but oftentimes it was just at the market square. It would be like if I went down to that little plaza with the fountain next to the willow tree and just started preaching. Now, in John Wesley's day, it was received as the church that doesn't want me is coming to me. They must actually care about me. It was seen as the church going to where the people are and serving them and caring for them and inviting them. What happens if I go down and stand on the rim of the fountain next to Willow Tree and start preaching? <laughs> like, ten of you were like, you're going to look crazy, right? That message, that practice would not be received in the same way today as it would be back then, right? Now, if maybe if someone stopped and actually listened to what I say, they might hear the compassion, they might hear an invitation, but if they only see me or hear bits and pieces, if they're not going to assume crazy, what other word might they assume? You know this. Judgmental, Right? The church leaves its doors to yell at us and tell us what we're doing wrong and why we should be inside the doors. That's the message that people hear and see. But are there other ways to be where the people are, as Ariel says? I want to be where the people are. Are there other ways to be where the people are that aren't standing on the rim of a fountain and shouting, yeah, yeah. And a lot of you do it all the time. We funded some of you doing it at the beginning of the year. Remember, we gave you 100 bucks to go make it a good year, and you all did it. You all did it. There are other ways to do it, which leads us to what, this is why the postures of faith is so important. Because on the one end of the spectrum, the institution will fail when, when, we, when we stray from our core values. But another way institutions can fail is when we mistake our practices for our values and we hold on to the wrong thing. 
the underlying postures have to be even more basic so that they can apply to whatever the problem is. Because we may face the same problem that Wesley's day did, that people don't feel welcome in the church and, and engagement in the church is going down. But that same Pew article I read talked about how not that long ago, engagement with the church in America was like 80, 90 percent. Now, the church has never been perfect in welcoming and serving everyone that comes through their doors. But in an era when there are 80 and 90 percent of people coming, the problem isn't how do we be where the people are. The problem is what do we do with them when they are with us? So you see, the postures have to be more basic than that. We'll close today by reflecting for a few moments on our scripture and seeing that, that this problem isn't unique to us. This isn't a woe is us. This is, a, this is how life works. Our passage comes from the book of Hebrews, which, as I said, it's, it's more of a sermon than a letter. And it was believed to have been written uh, between the years of 80 and 100, which would put it 50 to 70 years after the resurrection which means this is a sermon generally for the second generation of believers, the second generation within the early church. And listen for what the preacher warns against. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that none of you have an evil, unfaithful heart that abandons the living God. What does it mean to abandon? To leave? To move away from? But what has to happen first internally before you actually leave? Before you actually walk away? You begin to assume. You begin to neglect. And this may all happen very quickly. <laughs> this may all happen in a moment. But you don't just walk out the door. Or you don't just walk out of a relationship in a moment. There's something that happens inside first. That's this process. Forgetting, neglecting, moving away from what caused our flourishing. The preacher goes on, instead, encourage each other every day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you become insensitive to God because of sin's deception. Encouraging, reminding. How often are we supposed to encourage and remind? Every day. Why? Why do we need to encourage and remind one another of the love of God every day? Because all it takes is one day to start to move away, doesn't it? It doesn't take long for these things to happen. Sometimes it can. It can take a long time. But this temptation is, is real. It is present. It's urgent. We can head down this spectrum without even realizing it so quickly. And notice, too, it wasn't just encourage yourself. Hebrews isn't saying, look, look in the mirror, say your mantras. Who are we supposed to encourage? Each other. This is a communal thing. It would be wonderful if all of us learned how to individually make the special sauce of the church. But, but this is a collaborative kitchen. <laughs> this is a co-op, right? We need to do this together. This is a communal responsibility. And the danger, if we don't, the pastor says, we become insensitive to God because of sin's deception. And if that's not corruption, I, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. And the pastor concludes, we are partners with Christ, but only if we hold on to the confidence we had in the beginning until the end. We're partners with Christ. That's the flourishing. That's the benefit of the special sauce. That's what, that's what happens. That's what comes through a healthy faith and a healthy church community. But the pastor says we are only partners with Christ if we hold on to the confidence, or I might say the faith, we had in the what? Beginning. If we hold on to the faith we had in the beginning. Holding on to something takes work, doesn't it? How many of you have ever, ever carried a sleeping child out of Disney? Even ones that's 70 pounds and should be able to walk on their own, but can't or won't. How many of you have ever... How many dads or dudes or even some strong ladies do all the groceries at one time, right? It takes work to hold something, doesn't it? And the longer you hold it, the more tired you get. It takes work. But that work is not to earn God's love or earn salvation. That work is, is to be who we were called to be. And we hold on to the faith, the belief, the practice, the postures from the beginning. And we hold on it, onto it until when? the end and in the church the end comes in two ways 
the church collapses or Jesus comes back. I sure hope we make it to that second one. The goal is to, as best as possible, live in the spirit and the postures of the first generation. To recognize and be on guard from where and how and when we have strayed so that we can and should return. And recognize that that is possible. There is no point of no return with God. Amen? There is no point of no return. And again, I think Lakeside's in generation two. We are, this is not a, and so next week, if we don't raise five million dollars, this place is going to close, okay? So happy face. We're in good shape. I just want to make sure we're moving in the right direction. And I think this is a valuable teaching to help us as we come out of the pandemic into the new season of life and into the new season of what Lakeside looks like. Decline is what happens when you forget. Renewal and revival is what happens when you rediscover and remember. Amen.